All right, so welcome back to Chopping It Up, man. This is the channel by the underdog for the underdog. Today we're speaking with Emily. Emily, you wanted to come in and speak a few things. I know we're going to get to your brother here in a little bit who passed about a year ago, right? Yes. So before we get into that, let's start with your younger years, your addiction. Where did your addiction start? Tell us a little bit about you, your name, age, and just a little introduction. Um, I'm Emily. I'm 24 years old. Um, now I'm a stay-at-home mom, but six, seven years, that wasn't the case. I mean, I started using drugs relatively young. Um, I want to say my drug addiction started, you know, marijuana I was I had 88 I was ADHD so I had Adderall um alcohol growing up um my house was a party house and uh my mom was in prison um doing 20 years federal time okay for what um my mom got caught selling drugs and uh around multiple state borders and guns and Okay. It was a so, mess. So it was something you grew up around. You grew up around drugs and people mm -hmm. using alcohol, stuff like that. Yeah. So my, when I lived in town, when my parents lived in town, our house was the house. I mean, every weekend it was drinking, partying, you know, big blowout parties. And it was, I mean, it was something that was normal growing up. Um. I remember when I was a teenager and I would go to my friend's house and they wouldn't be drinking and everybody be sitting around watching TV and stuff like that. I'm like, man, these people are weird. Like, Because they were normal. Yeah, because they were normal. My normal was completely different. Mm -hmm. um, then um, I ended up doing a lot of juvie time. Um, I stole my parents' ha a car and I wrecked it into a house. Okay. How old were you when did that? That happened. 13. Okay. And uh, and then I got some batteries. Um, I did about six months juvie time, and I went to two different rehabs. Um, so wait, what did you start using after marijuana? Like you're using a little marijuana and alcohol because that was basically what was in the house? Yeah, and then um, I was prescribed Adderall, and I started mm -hmm. Adderall, and then Adderall turned into Coke, Coke okay. turned into crack, Crack turned into pills. And Smoking crack at what age? The first time I ever smoked crack. God, I was young. I had to really think. It was definitely my early teens when I first smoked crack. And, you know, I was, and I was like, you know, I had a lot of mental health problems growing up. So doing drugs was like an escape from all of that. And I think that's what anchored me so badly is that, like, at that time, you know, early teenager, you're doing drugs, you're running around, you're, like, having fun, you know, and, well, fun, you think it is. Right. And you don't realize the impact it has on you in the long run. And um, I feel like for drugs, for me, it was not a want or a need thing. It was, at that time, I was in love with them. I mean, I was completely in love with drugs it was my escape from reality i was the kind of i didn't have to think about anything when i was using i wasn't depressed i wasn't sad i was normal that was my normal was when i was high okay so how are you getting high where are you getting money for drugs and things at this age um a lot of it was the crowd i was hanging out with okay. i mean i hung out um, I had a couple good friends, you know, and then I hung out with girls that, you know, were older than me. I mean, I was 12, 13 years old hanging out with 18, 19, 20 years wow. old. I mean, I was, you know, in that scene with older people and a lot of them were my brother's friends. I mean, that was somebody that I clung to a little bit in that time. And... I would hang out with them. They would be doing stuff. I would start doing stuff. And it just, I didn't, it was just the right people. I mean, I didn't need, I can't, the first time I paid for drugs, I was like 16, 17 years old. The rest were just handed to me. I mean, I never had to worry about buying drugs. 
So when was the first time you started to see that, like, this is a problem? Like, this is an issue. I'm waking up. I'm wanting this or, or a withdrawal or anything like that. When I went to jail, I was, um, I dropped out of high school at 17. I was my senior year. And uh, I had gotten a bunch of charges, racked up a crap load of charges. And I was on the run. And I got caught. Because eventually you always get caught. I was telling myself, I'm never, they're never going to catch me. Uh, I got caught. And uh, when I went to the holding cell, uh, the next morning I woke up sick as a dog. I, mean, I was so sick. And I thought it was something in the jail. Like, I'm like, something in this jail is making me sick. But I was detoxing. Like, and... It continued to go on. I would get out and then I would come back in. And when I would come back in, I'd start detoxing again. I remember one time I was so bad that I couldn't pick my head out of the toilet. I mean, I felt like all my bones were being crushed. It was one of the worst pains I've ever gone through my entire life. And I, I was literally begging God to take me out of this world because the detox was so bad. I mean... From what? Like, and you never, like, number one, oh. from what? And number two, you never felt like that on the street? I never went really without on the right, street. Okay. I was always, you know, very, very well, you know, I was running around with older men. Mm -hmm. I was 17 years old running the street of Baltimore. I mean, going to Baltimore every other day with my boyfriend who was 33. Mm. And I mean, it was very, um, this I never had to go without. And for me, my drug of choice is crack cocaine. I mean, I prefer to smoke crack, but at one point I was very addicted to speedballing. Okay. I um So was it heroin or fentanyl heroin. or was you speedballing with? Heroin. I okay. um and then right before I stopped, I started IV using and Yeah, I that's mean, where that's where it comes to No nah. That's where it comes to a head, doesn't it? That's where it's all gonna end nah. up most times. And, I mean, for the longest time I went without IV using, I was smoking it, I was snorting it, you know, stuff like that. But then when I wanted to come down, I'll never forget when I started it. I had been up on a crack high for days, and I'm talking, like, a pretty significant number. And I was like, I need to come down, you know. I'm feeling jittery, my heart's racing. And my boyfriend at the time was, do a line of this. You know, you'll come down, stuff like that. And I had seen that. He was shooting it, and I was like, you know, well, let me do it, you know, and I'll he, he passes out as soon as he does it. Mm -hmm. So let me just do this one line. I did the one line, and then one line turned into every time I was smoking crack, and I was just, you know, all right, you know, I've got my high. I'm ready to go lay down. It turned into doing it, and then mm -hmm. for a while, after a while, a line of heroin wasn't cutting it no more. So then I shot up for my first time. And I'd say I've shot up a handful of times. I wouldn't say, you know, I was so, you know, oh, my God. I only shot up like eight, nine, ten times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking back now, it's crazy to me. For one, it's crazy that a 33-year-old would be of a 17-year-old. Right. That's insane to me. Like, if something, if my daughter came home and told me she was with a 33 year old i would kirk okay mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's no yeah, i want to meet this 33 year old immediately that's how yeah. i would be for sure i need to i need to talk to this dude something's not right no there's nothing right about the situation um if i mean like i look back now and i see everything i have i mean i was i got my my ged in prison i i didn't get to go to proms or homecomings or my graduation. I didn't do none of that. I was too worried about running the street, running with the wrong crowds, getting high, going to parties, all that fighting. Doing um, everything you'd been shown through your childhood though, right? That's all the same stuff you had witnessed growing up, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that was so normal, you know. I honestly... In my immediate family, my sister, she never went to homecoming prom. She didn't graduate. All, you know, everybody that lived in my household, they didn't do that kind of stuff. I mean, that wasn't something you didn't get to go out and buy your prom dress. And that's one of my biggest regrets probably is I never got to experience those kind of things. I see 
pictures of moms posting on Facebook of their daughter going to prom or homecoming graduation, stuff like that. And it honestly makes me sad because I should have been able to do that. I shouldn't have wore a cap and gown at Lakin Correctional Center. I should have wore a cap and gown up here at Hampshire High where I was going to high school. And <clears throat> that's one of the probably the hardest things for me is the fact that I missed on so much stuff. And I think because of that, I overcompensate for my kids. Mm -hmm. My kids have everything they want. I mean, my son tells me he wants a toy. It's ordered on Amazon that night. It's anything he could possibly want, anything my daughter could possibly want, they get right away. And I think that's one of the reasons is because I <coughs> I feel like I didn't, I want to give them everything I missed out on, you know. And it's just addiction is something that will come in. It's sneaky. I mean, one minute you're just using and you're having fun, and the next minute you're a full-blown addict who would literally do anything for drugs. I mean, there's, it's just one of those things that it will literally take your life in an instant, and not even, like, dead take your life. Like, you have no life that doesn't revolve around drugs, and it's sad because every time I would get out of prison, I would tell myself, you know, I don't need to use I was using within hours of getting out of jail, but I would tell myself I don't need it. You know, I was such in denial about being an addict. I truly believed I didn't have a problem that I was one of those people that could use and put down and not have to worry about being addicted or anything like that. I was just one of those people, you know, I didn't believe that. I was an addict and I probably never would have until my last bid. I did a, a, what's say, a little over a year and the judge put me in the Anthony Center and uh, it was this program for people that didn't have their diploma inside the prison and I, um, I went in and part of that program was, you know, Basically, I did some drug rehabilitation and worked on myself. I had to do counseling, stuff like that. And that's when I realized, you know, when she's up there explaining an addict and telling us, you know, these mm -hmm. are the way you would feel. I'm like, dang, I'm hitting every mm -hmm. one of these categories. I mean, this doesn't even, you know, and then. So before that, did you look at the people around you and, and like. So you're seeing all these people that they're fighting, drinking, smoking, whatever. Do you look at them and see that they are addicts? Do you care that they're, do you like judge them that way at all? No, because they live normal lives. I mean, my dad is an alcoholic. Um, growing up, my dad carried a job. I mean, my dad would work. Right, a lot of alcoholics do. A lot of people drink every yes, day and go to work and yeah. 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., you know, every day my dad was at work. And um, people that came over our house that, you know, were very, very in active addiction, they were going to work and taking care of their kids and their kids would come with them. And I mean, I'm seeing, you know, I'm thinking that's normal, you know, because you have these people in active addiction and they're still living normal lives. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you can't be an addict and live a normal life. Like I think of. Honestly, I think back to my mom when I would think my picture of an addict at that time was my mom, you know. I'd heard, I didn't have a close relationship with my mom growing up, you know. She, of course, she was in prison. We didn't talk a lot, maybe once every couple months. Letters were one in many. I mean, she always sent me a birthday card, but it wasn't a lot, and, um, and for me, from everything I had heard about her, because I don't remember much of her um, as a child, even though I lived with her. I remember mm. very, very little. Um, my mom was an addict from what I had heard. She didn't have a job. She was selling drugs. She was, you know, the things I heard was very, she was strung out. Mm -hmm. She was smoking crack. She was sleeping with this man, that man. 
what I know now is different, you know, but the things I heard, that was my picture of an addict was someone that could not live a normal life and only their life only revolved around drugs. And I guess that's the picture I had in my head. So I never thought that all these people around me were in active addiction at all. Yeah. Well, and if you ask most people, like, for example, if you tell them to describe an alcoholic, what they're going to describe is that guy that stands on the corner and he's begging for wine, whatever like mm -hmm. that. They don't see the alcoholic that goes to work every day and raises a family. My grandfather was an alcoholic, raised four kids, my mom and three boys. My dad. They all do great today, but he was an alcoholic from 13 to 62 the day he died. My dad's still an alcoholic. Um, my brothers are alcoholics. Um, my one brother, he's moved off alcohol a lot since having his daughter. But my brother, Will, was an, a very, very hardcore alcoholic. I've seen my brother and my dad um, not drink for a couple hours at the beginning of the day and be shaking like this. Mm -hmm. And at 26 years old, you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, my dad's pretty much been an alcoholic since his teens. And he's going on 54, 55 this year. I mean... This is, my grandfather was an alcoholic, and it just keeps stemming and stemming down the line. I mean, so it it's like how many a percentage of your family that's alcoholics or addicts versus not alcoholics or addicts? The percentage is, I want to say 90 10 mm. and 90 leaning towards alcoholic and addict. So it's easily accepted and it's easy to get, it's easy to do, it's easy to see other people just living without a whole lot of dire consequences, right? Yeah. I mean, and my dad, he was in, I've seen my dad in and out of jail, you know, and that should have been an eye opener itself, you know, but it didn't bother me, you know, I've seen my uncle's in jail right now, I mean, for um, possession of crack, I mean, there, it's just when you see so many people doing it, you think that's normal, you know. Like, like I said, when I was growing up, other people were weird. I mean, I truly thought that everybody else was weird, and my family was normal. So this is one of the coolest things that I get to learn by doing these is that that thought right there that we don't know what other people's childhood is like, or that our childhood is as good or bad or whatever until we see other people's so like you're a child you're looking at other people's childhoods theirs is actually normal but you think it's totally crazy because you feel like yours is normal yeah i feel like these people are insane like who wants to sit around all day and watch tv and you know relax put and together not do... puzzles yeah and you know play family game board nights games. and stuff like never that. had board game night huh no no, I never did no, like that. no, no. I mean, the most I think we did as a family was when my dad first got with my stepmom. We went to the drive-in movie theater. Hmm. But other than that, no. I mean, it was very, very. Our life, our house was never empty. Let me put it like that. We never had an empty house, um, and it was just that there was always somebody there I mean up until my dad moved to the middle of nowhere everywhere we went was a party house I mean that was the spot to be at on the weekends and not even just the weekends it was through the week mm -hmm. I mean I can remember times coming home from school and our we had a bar room and it was a room. It had a bar, a big flat screen TV. I mean, bar at home, right? Yeah. Didn't have to go spend that big money on beer when you can buy it for a lot less. Yeah, and I remember coming home from school some days in the bar room, being full of people. Mm -hmm. And again, that was normal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're probably happy to come in. Hey, what's up? What's yeah, up? What's like, up? and everybody saying hi. Mm -hmm. Feels like a big family. That's what it honestly felt like. Was like our family is just really close. Right. That's what I honestly thought. Like, we just have a really, really close family. And now that I've 
grown up and took myself out of that scene. You know, I am one of those people that sit at home all day and watch TV and clean and cook. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't do anything else. I mean, okay. So where does all of this come to a head? Like where does, uh, you know, you finally wake up and say, you know what, this time I'm not going to use when I get out of jail. I met my husband. Okay. Um, my husband's brother was a guard at the jail. And uh, I had met my husband's brother. And um, through him, I had met my husband. And my husband's very, my husband's never even smoked a cigarette his entire life. I mean, Mm -hmm. he's very straight and narrow, doesn't do drugs, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. Hardworking man goes to work every day. I mean, he is, his biggest addiction is probably the gym. I mean, he is never been I think he's so innocent when it comes to things like this I met my husband and he opened my eyes to a world that didn't revolve around drugs and still gave me the thrill that I wanted out of life I mean he showed me that life didn't have to revolve around this opening and closing door of jail and he showed me that drugs didn't even need to be a factor in my life I mean we, we do exciting things together to the point that I don't need drugs. I mean, I'm excited. What used to bring me excitement in the drugs brings me excitement in the things we do now. Like Give me an example. Um, example is the beaches. We go to the beach, Florida, every year. And we do stuff at the beach, like shopping and sitting on the beach. And we went to, uh, about two years ago, we went to like an amusement park at the beach and did golf cart racing and mini golf and just all around all of that and then he gave me my kids and well my first first one was the one that really was like oh my god like everything I was missing in life went away when I had him I mean he gave my son gave me a purpose that drugs could never even touch I mean, my son gave me a purpose to live, a purpose to keep fighting every day to be sober. And every single day, I mean, he shows me more reasons to not use again. I mean, being a mother and a wife is my main reason for not using for the simple fact that they give me what drugs, more than what drugs could have ever gave me. I mean... I there's days where I do have hard days. I'm not going to say that I never think about using and I never ever like have cravings or anything like that. For the first when I first got sober, I had to cut everyone off. I cut my entire family off. I cut every single person off except for my husband and his parents, really. Um because if not, I would have never been strong enough to get sober. I mean, and then when I finally got sober, like was able to get past that lump and start introducing them back in my life and I would see them, honestly, it wouldn't be a, oh my God, I miss that. It was mm. like a, oh my God, you're still doing that sort of feeling. You have to build that disgust, right? Where you, yeah. You almost look at it and you're like, I just don't want to do that anymore. Yes. And it took me six, seven months before I could even reintroduce them into my life. And I had to do it in very small doses. Mm -hmm. Like, it was like, and I did not do it alone. People, places, and things is one of the biggest things to say. You know, you go around the same people, the same places that are smoking the same crack in the same rooms, you're going to probably do it again. Yeah. And I, it was just, if I had to introduce, when I introduced myself, my husband was always with me at first. Like, I had to make sure he was. So I had that extra lenient, like, Mm -hmm. like extra. Sure. Person with me, Made like a you shoulder. Feel safe too. Yeah, and then when after I after a while, I was able to do it by myself. And now I even occasionally drink at the bar. Like I'll go, I'll uh, prime example. My father in law's birthday was the twenty third of May. We went out to the bar and I had some drinks, you know, but I didn't come home. And where six years ago a drink would have turned to, uh, seven years. A drink would have turned into a bender, and a bender would have turned into 
fucking, or sorry, about 72 hours of doing drugs and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Now I can go to the bar, have a couple drinks, come home, go to bed. Yeah, that's hard for some people too, man, but I'm glad that you can do that and still be able to celebrate without going back down that road. Yeah, now, I've never gone any farther than drinking. I haven't smoked weed mm-hmm. in, since I stopped using. Right, you feel like if you smoked weed, it would trigger everything back into effect, or you just don't even want to attempt that? I just don't even, like I said, I don't, I don't know, so I'm like, well, I don't even need that, you know? And you don't need it in the first place, so why reintroduce yeah. it into your life, right? Um, I'm very 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 lenient i mean very very stern on what i take um prime example they wanted to give me fentanyl when my son and daughter was born and i refused Mm -hmm. i wouldn't i don't take any kind of narcotic at all i don't take any muscle relaxers i don't take any stimulants the most i take is tylenol (laughs) i mean i and vitamins i mean i'm very 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 stern on that so how long Um, have you been clean October 24th, uh, 2019. Okay. Um, almost four years. Five. Okay. So almost five. Your math is a little better than mine <laughs> off top, right? You're supposed, to be, you're supposed to say five years, <laughs> but you know your clean date and everything. I don't know a clean date for me. I don't really have a specific day that I can say was the last time I used the same way people would if you're going to jail or whatever. And you know you went to jail this day, so you haven't used since that day. It's not like that for me. But I've quit so many times, I just quit counting. You get tired yeah. of counting. It's like counting off jail days, you know? Mm-hmm. You're getting down to that 90 days, you start counting, and it just makes it seem like I didn't want to check off the days. It makes it drag, I feel like, when yeah, you're in jail and you're does. counting the days. Yeah. Um, so nothing nothing else other than a little bit of alcohol here and there, man. Mm-hmm. Complete abstinence. That's cool. Yeah, like you I replace mean, your kids. You, you put your kids in the spot. They give you the satisfaction that drugs gave you in a totally different way, in a more beneficial way, in a productive way. Yes, my kids are great. Mm-hmm. I mean... My daughter is just starting to try to crawl, and seeing those things are great. My son, he is headstrong and intelligent and funny, and he makes, gosh, he makes me laugh so many times in a day. I don't even think I can count, and my daughter, she's beautiful, and she's just starting to get her personality and she has the cutest laugh and my kids give me a reason to be here and my husband honestly I mean my husband is amazing he's hard working and he's lovable and he's an amazing father caregiver husband I mean mm-hmm. anything I could possibly want are the kids we get it I mean he yeah you got to be grateful for all that right yes he thrives and even my husband's parents they have took me in as their own from the beginning um not to backtrack a little bit but when i first went to jail my husband um i went to jail in the beginning of our relationship um and he stood beside me i mean um i was doing a 60 day stint um and it was for failing my drug screen right when we got together and we had only been together for a, like a month, maybe. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to stand beside this girl, you know. And um, I always asked, I'm asked him what his thought process was on it. And he just basically says, you know, I like you. Like, and his mom and his pap, which his pappy just died on April 1st. I love his pap to death. He was like my grand, like the, like a grandfather I never had. Um, his mom and his pap stood up in court for me, barely knowing me. And, you know, was like, basically, like, when she gets out, she'll be residing with us. And, you know, and they have a very good name in the community. And it was just knowing that somebody was in my corner was such a great feeling. Because those court dates when you're getting brought in from the jail, you look around the crowd, and majority of the time, you don't see nobody you know. You don't see nobody standing up for you. You don't see even a familiar face. And seeing that familiar face and having them stand up and talk about how I deserved another chance was just an amazing feeling. And to this day, I'm forever grateful for them, for the things they continuously do for me. I mean, it's not even just a couple things here and there. They are still his father and mother still do everything and anything I ask them to. I mean, they are 
like my second parent. I mean, they, his, his mom is one of my role models in life. I mean, she's amazing. Um, so you found a more productive side of the world, basically, yes. right? Yeah. That whole part that you thought was weird when you was a kid is what you really needed in life. Yes. And I think part of me always searched for that stability. Mm, of course. I think life. we all do. The security of it. And I'm not saying, you know, I've had like a horrible childhood. Mm. I've hear, heard people's stories that oh, like, sure. oh my God, I couldn't imagine living like that. Because after my dad got with my stepmom, they did try, you know, like, but they were already so caught up in that life that. And surrounded by it, man. It's it's yeah. easy when you're surrounded by it. I hung and, out with them back then. I remember I've known them. I've known that whole group my whole life. Yes. And I was in many of them houses for many a party. Yes. And it honestly breaks my heart because I know that my dad is not going to break that cycle. That's a cycle that my dad's going to be into a dies. Mm -hmm. I mean. And I pray that, you know, my siblings can break the cycle the way my, like I said, my brother Trevor, he has, he's made a beautiful life for his daughter and, you know, he has a drink now and then, but overall he is very stable. He's one of the ones like me that can say, you know, we made it, right. you know. And that's what this is about too, man, is being able to, you know, share your story, talk about how you came up, somebody's going to be able to relate to it and understand you know, that, that they might have come from the same place. Or maybe it's somebody that doesn't understand what it's even like to come up around that and what it's about. But seeing you come out, raise your kids, and doing everything the way you're doing it, that's what it's all about, man. The underdog's winning, right? Yes, recovery is so possible. I mean, and it's hard. It is. It's, it's work. You got you to gotta put time in. Yes. You got to yes. put time in. It's not like something you can wake up and just do. I mm -hmm. mean, you have to literally, you work your ass off. Participate. Yes, and... I mean, think um, about how much time you spent getting high. Think about how many things, obstacles. You went through to do yeah, it. You would go through all of them without doubt and yeah. find your way. right? And now, you know, you put that energy into getting clean or something else. And mm -hmm. it makes a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. It really does. Well, that's awesome. I, um, I want to end this episode off right there before we get into talking about Will. Okay. But then we're going to go and talk about that and what everything happened with there. Um mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because you said you basically want to talk about how the one-time thing can take somebody away from you, right? Just being reckless. I mean, right. I'm sure it wasn't his one time, you know, but right. you don't have to be an addict to OD and mm -hmm. die. I mm -hmm. mean, to grab that one pill that'll do it. Yes, just being extremely reckless with your life can literally take your life and right. hurt so many people around you. Right. All right, so I'm going to cut this one off real quick right here, man. Like, subscribe, and share. I appreciate everything you just said right here up to this point. I want to separate these two episodes because I feel like this other episode is going to be a little bit different when we get to talking about Will. Okay? Okay, okay yeah. sweet. Well, we're going to get into Will. Um, just to give you all a little context, Will took a fentanyl pill yes. in the past, correct? Yes. So we're going to talk about that next, man. I'm going to link that video right here at the end of this one, and we're going to take a short break and get started with that. Okay. Sweet.